If for you to know the truth about the Bible and prophecy, you've got to know Jesus. He says, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. God became a man. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Tonight's presentation is a little unique because sometimes people come to a prophecy program like this and they're thinking, you know, I just want to know when is the end coming? How is it going to unfold? What do the prophecies teach? And, and where do I run and hide so that I can survive? But really, at the core of all Bible prophecy, it's talking about a person, and it's talking about how you can be saved eternally, not just live a little longer in this life. You know, I want to open to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, in the vision there, the Apostle John says, I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and on the of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Here in this vision, it talks about a throne where you'd expect to see a king seated, but it's got a slain lamb. Now this is really an elementary Bible symbol. On the throne there is Jesus. He is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, and it's slain. This is a bleeding lamb. Now, I don't know about you, but blood is not, for me, a pleasant subject. Uh, my wife is a physical therapist, and she's worked in hospitals, and it doesn't bother her, but uh, makes me a little squeamish. And uh, I think that's a natural reaction. Even children, the first time they start bleeding, uh, they, there's a, sometimes a look of panic on their face like, oh, no, I'm leaking. Now what? You know, what's going to happen? And it just seems so unnatural. But, you know, the Bible tells us that life is in the blood. That's Leviticus 17, verse 11. Even back then, they recognized every cell in your body is both nourished and cleansed. It receives its oxygen and the bad gases are removed through the circulation system by blood. The life is in the blood. And the Bible tells us that God has made of one blood all people, meaning we're all related. And even DNA experts have tracked all people on the planet back to common ancestors. Even National Geographic agrees with that. Newsweek had a magazine that said there must have been an Eve because all the DNA of humans is common. And it's also true that everybody who is going to be in the kingdom is going to be there by virtue of the blood of one man. It's a blood transfusion of the Lamb of God that saves everybody. You know, during the bubonic plague, they, they discovered that, well, they didn't know it then, but they discovered afterward, the only cure for the bubonic plague is to get a transfusion from somebody who was exposed but developed a resistance. And according to the Bible, the only person who has come into this world and lived a perfect life is Jesus. And the only cure for the problem of sin is a transfusion of his blood. Now, as we're talking about the subject of prophecy, be honest, would some of you like to know who is the beast and what is the mark of the beast in 666? What does that all mean? Come on, wouldn't you like to know that? The Bible talks about Babylon, the fall of Babylon. If you read in Revelation chapter 14, it's got three angels. It starts at verse 6, and it talks about the beast, and it talks about those who worship the beast, and it talks about Babylon. But you know what it says just before that? It says, I saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth. You can't really explain these apocalyptic symbols outside of the context of the everlasting gospel. In other words, I cannot, as much as you might want me to, separate these prophetic teachings from the way the Bible wraps them around Jesus. All of these teachings are wrapped around something called redemption. And so if I tell you the whole truth about prophecy and you understand it perfectly, 
If you don't know Jesus, will it do you any good? Not according to prophecy. Well, back to the question answer format. I want to make sure I cover all my points. This is as much for my benefit as yours. Question number one. Does God really care about me personally? Yes. Jeremiah 31, verse 3, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Now, how many of you would admit that there are times when you've wondered if God loves you? Does he really care? Have your children ever wondered if you love them? I've told you that we have five children. We had six children. And our oldest son, Micah, when he was born, beautiful baby boy. Big blue eyes, curly blonde hair, and just was a delightful little boy. When he was about 19 months old, he was very lethargic in his crib, and we got worried. Took him to the emergency room of the local hospital, and after a brief examination, the doctor said he may have spinal meningitis. But the only way to be sure is to do a test, a spinal tap. And they do this while you're awake. And they take a long needle. They have to insert it between the vertebrae and the spine, extract spinal fluid, and test it. Well, our little boy is just he's walking around a little bit. He says mommy and daddy and banana and doesn't really understand what's going on, but he just knows he doesn't feel good. And so they take him in the room. Mom excused herself. She said, I can't watch this. And so I stayed in there with him as the doctors and nurses held him. And the doctor was an intern, and he had not done this very often. And it absolutely broke my heart as I had to watch him two or three times push the needle into the back, trying to find the right spot. And Micah is awake, and he's looking at me, and he's crying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And he couldn't understand why would I let them do this to him. And don't you know that broke my heart? He thought, Dad doesn't love me. Oh, nothing could have been further from the truth. I would have traded places with him in an instant. Turns out he did have spinal meningitis, and he recovered from that. But, uh, you know, it just broke my heart to think that there was a time when he wondered, don't you love me? Why are you letting them hurt me? If you think your children should trust you love them, how much more should you trust that God loves you. He's a much better parent than I am and than you are. Isn't that right? He loves you, no doubt about it. How has God demonstrated his love for us? You know that verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's one of the most famous verses in the world. It's a powerful verse. That's why people quote it. It sort of encapsulates the greatness of the gospel. He so loved the world, yes, but he so loved you individually. He loves you so much, I'd venture to say, that if you were the only human on the planet that had sinned, he would have come down and gone through everything that he went through just for you. And if he has enough power to save the world from its sins, do you think he has enough to save you? How do I receive him and pass from death unto life? How does this happen? Again, I want to stop and I want to remind you why this is so important. Do you want to understand what's happening? Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. If you are God and you're going to reveal the truth about the future to people on the planet, would you reveal it to the ones that are surrendered to you or the ones who are still in rebellion? What I'm giving you tonight in this presentation of the basics of the gospel is the key to unlock the future. Because when you do surrender to the Lord, you hear him differently. Even Jesus, after he was baptized, it says the heavens were opened and he heard a voice. When Isaiah saw the Lord and he surrendered to the Lord, he heard the voice of the Lord saying, you'll hear differently. God will speak to your heart like he never has before. All of a sudden, the frequency, you ever go through the radio, it's just static, you don't understand, but if you dial it in right, oh, it gets very clear. And when you surrender your heart to God, all of a sudden, it starts to get clear. And even when you read his word, it suddenly gets translated and it makes a lot more sense. So how do I receive him and pass from death to life? 
Well, first of all, recognize that you're a sinner. All have sinned. Every person who's ever been born is born with a selfish nature, and we've all sinned. And uh, you're not alone. We're all infected with this terminal disease called sin. It says, we've all turned everyone to his own way. In Isaiah 53, verse 6, sin makes us selfish. Most people make their decisions from day to day based on what's in it for me. What will this mean to me? We're naturally very selfish. It's a supernatural miracle when God gives us new hearts and we start being motivated by love. Many of us have no idea what that means until the Spirit of God comes into your life. It's very real, friends. That's what the Bible teaches. We've all turned everyone to his own way. And the penalty for sin is death. Now, I know this sounds pretty serious, and it is. Why is that? If God loves us, then why is the penalty for sin death? You're living on an island in the South Pacific, beautiful island. You're very happy. It's a paradise. And you and your spouse have 10 children. We're still assuming you can be happy with 10 children. But then one of your children becomes infected, small island, with a deadly, painful disease, and it's contagious. Now, you've got to make a choice. You've got to put that child on a raft and push it out to sea, or let it stay on the island and all of the children will die. What are you going to do? That's a terrible dilemma to be faced with. But this is sort of what God's faced with, with this planet has a disease. And God's got other angels and creations out there in the cosmos, but we're sort of quarantined right now because of sin. Again, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. The reason he could die for our sins is he came to earth as a human. As our example, he lived a perfect life. He showed us what the Father's like, and then he traded places with us. At the cross, Jesus was taking what we deserve. He's giving us what he deserves. He gives us his strength and his holiness and his peace, and he took our misery and our separation, our pain, our punishment. And when you accept that by faith, it becomes real. That's why so often when someone came to Jesus and they were healed, he said, your faith has made you whole. God's given you all the power of faith. You can choose to believe, and then it happens. Or you can choose to go through your life as a doubter and a skeptic, and you'll have just what you believe. All things are possible if you believe. I was in the Philippines a couple of years ago, and uh, I went to a prison there, 10,000 inmates. And I, after going there, I heard a story about these two brothers. One converted, became a Christian, and the, his twin brother, identical twins, he didn't convert to Christianity because his wife was against it. And his life started to spiral downhill. He drove a jipney, a taxi there, and, and had a wife and several children. His Christian brother, he never did get married. And, and uh, the jipney driver, twin, had an accident while drinking, killed a mother and two of her children. He was tried for manslaughter, put in prison for 30 years. And now his wife and children had no father. His brother went to prison to visit him. And after spending some time with him, he said, look, I know the Lord. I've got eternal life. I could stay here in prison and work for Jesus and minister to these people here. Your family needs you. Take my pass. Take my clothes. The guards will never know the difference. Go to your family. And his brother, after just a little urging, accepted it. And you know what? Because of the love of the Christian brother, it broke his heart. He accepted Christ. And he went out to his family and had freedom because of the sacrifice that his brother made. Jesus hasn't done less, less for you. He is the just who has traded places with us, the unjust. What must I do in order to obtain this gift of salvation? Answer, Matthew 7, 7. Jesus said, ask and you'll receive. He also says we need to be aware that we got a problem and he has the answer. That's called repentance. Repentance means being sorry for our sins and having a willingness to turn away from them. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? You read that up there? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we do our part and tell God that we're sorry, if we ask Jesus for his forgiveness 
and we confess that we're sinners. He promises us, unless you think God's a liar, that He'll forgive us. And not only that, He cleanses our record from all the unrighteousness of your life. He looks upon you as though you have never sinned before. Oh, I don't know what that does for you, friends, but I had a pretty big record racked up even by the time I was 17 when I came to Jesus. I mean, it meant a lot to me to have a new beginning. When I join His family through faith, what change does Jesus make in my life? You can read about this in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, when you receive the Lord, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then he says he'll give you his spirit, even the spirit of truth. You know him, that spirit of truth is a person. Jesus said, I am the truth. That's why I'm telling you, friends, I can't separate teaching you the truth about prophecy from Jesus because Jesus said, I am the truth. So how can you separate the two? If for you to know the truth about the Bible and prophecy, you've got to know Jesus. He revealed the truth in His Word, and that's why it survives so long. It's not like any other book. Will this changed life really be happier than the pleasures of the old life? Infinitely. For one thing, you've got a future, and that gives you hope. Hey, friends, I've been, I've been to the old world. I've been to the drugs and the drinking and the immorality and just the, I mean, just, I was exhibit A of living for the pleasures of the world. There's very little you could tell me about I didn't know about. Grew up, right, used to play 42nd Street in New York City as a kid. And you know what? There's nothing there, nothing to go back to. Let me put it to you this way, real quick. If I were to tell you, how would you like a Swiss bank account with a billion dollars in it and to be able to go to Las Vegas and do whatever you want to do, enjoy all the pleasures of the world, all the entertainment that you can afford? Don't answer me, but some of you are probably thinking, well, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Buy the best car. You could probably afford the best boyfriend or girlfriend. Best food, you can have the best of everything. Live like a king, penthouse suite. But there's fine print in this agreement. After 30 days, you die. You're going to be executed. Or, I tell you, you got to go to the hospital, and the doctor has to perform a painful surgery without anesthetic that's going to take 30 minutes. But when he's done with the surgery, you're going to live forever with a new body, and you'll never be sick again. You'll never have pain again. Okay, you got two options. Who would want to go have surgery without anesthetic? <laughs> but you know what I think? I'd rather do that knowing that then I've got eternal life in heaven than go to Vegas for 30 days and know every time I roll the dice or pull the slot machine, I'm just one more second to execution. You all really have one of those two choices. You can say, I want to enjoy the temporary pleasures of the world. You know, that's not even a good illustration. You know why? Because since becoming a Christian, I'm enjoying this life a lot better too. It's infinitely better for a Christian even here and now. I have a lot more fun now and I don't have a hangover. You know what I mean? It's a lot better being a Christian. Don't have the withdrawal from the drugs and the embarrassment and the, and the shame. Much better, even in this life. Christ said, I came to give you life more abundantly. But can I make myself do all the things a Christian can do? How can I manage this? On your own, you can't. Without God's help, Jesus said, without me, how much can you do? You can't do anything without Jesus. But there's another verse. It says in Philippians 4.13, I can do how many things? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Things I once thought I'd never be able to do. With God's help, you're able to do all things. You're able to be a new creature and live a new kind of life. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's, it's an ongoing process being a Christian. When you first come to Him, in some senses, it's like you're born again. You're like a baby and you can learn to walk and you may fall. Don't get discouraged. You get back up again. And the Lord takes your hand and He strengthens you and He teaches you and it gets better and better and more and more joyful and more and more abundant. And you are moving towards the promised land, not towards the slavery of Egypt. 
It's hard to obey God. You ever thought that before? Yeah, sometimes it is. You know why? The devil doesn't want you to. He wants to use you to say, see, they don't love you. They can't obey you. That's why he tempts you to disobey. Yes, you can. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. For this is the love of God. It tells us in 1 John 5, 3, that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not a burden. When you love him, you fall in love with Jesus. It's a delight. That's why Jesus said to the Father, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus surrendered to the Father whatever he wanted because he loved the Father. And when we love the Lord that way, we'll feel the same way. How can I be sure that keeping the commandments doesn't become legalism for me? How do I know that I'm not just doing it for the wrong reasons? Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. It's because we have the faith of Jesus, the same kind of faith that he had, the same kind of love he had, doing it not to be saved, but because we are saved. See, God saved the children of Israel first. After he saved them, he brought them to Mount Sinai and said, here's my law. God doesn't say in Egypt, here's my law, you keep it and I'll get you out of here. He saves us just like we are. So don't be thinking, Lord, I'd like to come to you, but first I've got to straighten out my life and then I'll accept you. No, you can't do that. You've got to accept him just like you are and then he helps you change. How can I be certain that my faith and love for Jesus will increase? When you come to the Lord the way you are, you want your faith to grow. Answer, search the scriptures. You know, if you're learning anything during this seminar, it's not Pastor Doug. I'm just sharing with you what I've learned in the Bible. We've got scripture, a lot of scripture every night. Am I right? We want you to keep studying the Bible because that's how your faith will grow. Search the scriptures. Pray. Three principal things. Read your Bible, the bread of life. You breathe. If a baby wants to grow, it eats. Bible. It breathes and it exercises. Share your faith. Tell others about it. Use what you're learning and you will grow. There's just no question about it. It's a natural law. Tell others what great things God has done for you. As I said, sharing your faith. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, so walk in Him. You then walk in that newness of life that He's given you. This is the good news of the gospel, friends. You know, Christ has offered to cleanse us from our sins. He's offered a blood transfusion to the whole world. I heard a fascinating story in a book a doctor related that there was this family that had two children and they both had a, a type of leukemia, which is basically a blood cancer, blood disease. And the little boy had recovered. It turns out his little sister had the same blood type. And so the doctor said, you know, to the parents, he said, this is your decision. We also need to ask little Billy. But um, he has the same blood type. He is the best candidate to avoid rejection of a transfusion that your little daughter might be healed. So the doctor said to little Billy, he said, you know, Sally's sick. And if you want Sally to, to live, we're going to need special blood. And you have that blood. Billy, would you be willing to give your blood to Sally? Uh, little Billy, he, he looked at the doctor and his lips started to quiver a bit. And then he looked at his sister and he said, yeah, I'll do it. So they set it up and they arranged a transfusion. And as, you know, the boy winced a little bit when the needle was put in his arm. And, and uh, he looked at his sister again. He smiled at her. And then he watched as the blood was running out of his arm into the container. And pretty soon he looked up to the doctor and he said, uh, how long will it take me to die? And then the doctor realized that when he asked little Billy to give his blood to his sister, he thought he was going to take all his blood. And the little boy was willing to do it that his sister might live. Think about that just selfless love. Does Jesus love you less? He has poured out his life that you might be saved. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with this week's special offer.
If we're being told to worship someone other than Jesus, is that biblical? Oh, it doesn't matter what church you go to, Pastor Doug. All, all rivers lead to the ocean. It doesn't matter what religion you are. That's exactly what the devil wants people to think. You know, buried in all the broken glass of the Christian religion, there's still a diamond, friends. In six days, God created the heavens and the earth. For thousands of years, man has worshipped God on the seventh day of the week. Now, each week, millions of people worship on the first day. What happened? Why did God create a day of rest? Does it really matter what day we worship? Who is behind this great shift? Discover the truth behind God's law and how it was changed. Visit SabbathTruth.com. Life's a curious thing. I mean, just when things seem under control, wham, you're hit with something new. Your marriage is good. Suddenly it's on the brink of divorce. The job's great. And then it's gone. And so's your life savings. You feel healthy. Then your doctor gives the bad news. What's coming next? You could look to the stars, but they don't have the answers. But this does. The Prophecy Study Bible by Amazing Facts. This Bible's special. Its 27 personal study guides lead you on a life-changing journey through God's Word to discover real answers to life's questions, from health and relationships to family and the future. The hope's in here. Get your Amazing Facts Prophecy Study Bible today by calling 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at AmazingFacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents. One location, so many possibilities. AmazingFacts.org. This mysterious individual appears all the way from Genesis to Revelation. It's Michael the Archangel. Who is Michael? Is he a cherubim, a seraphim? This angel general of the Lord's army. Would you like to understand this subject, friends? Then we've got a book that answers it very clearly using the scriptures and we'll send it to you for free. To get your free copy, go to amazingfacts.org or call the number on your screen and ask for offer number 170. And when you get this free resource, make sure and read it and then share it with someone else because God's message is our mission. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. 